Hello everyone, welcome to today's live broadcast, Investigative in Vitro Drug Toxicology with Human IPSC-Derived Cardiomyocytes. I'm Judy O'Rourke of LabRoots and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's webcast is presented by LabRoots.com, the leading social media site for science professionals and sponsored by Cellular Dynamics International, the largest producer of human-induced pluripotent stem cell tissue cells from non-clinical and clinical populations. Before we start, there are a few instructions. We want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. Answers are welcome, too. You can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can, and we'll follow up if we don't have time today. Want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear or see this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button at the top right or use the Q&A button. We'll make sure we try to resolve any issues. Now let's get right to today's presenters. We are proud to welcome Dr. Blake Anson, Product Manager at Cellular Dynamics International, and Dr. Matt Brock, Scientific Manager, Investigative Toxicology and Safety Assessment, Genentech. I will now turn it over to our speakers. All right, thank you, Judy. <clears throat> thank you, Judy, and uh, welcome, everybody. We, um, uh, as you said, we're going to be talking about uh, investigative in vitro drug toxicology uh, testing with human IPSC derived cardiomyocytes. It'll be a two part presentation. And the first part will be myself giving really an overview of the uh, in vitro reagent, I cell cardiomyocytes, human stem cell derived cardiomyocytes. <clears throat> I'll then go in and talk a little bit about some uh, advancements that we've made uh, on the cardiomyocytes, uh, our second generation product, as well as a little bit of uh, serum-free uh, recording conditions that we've just recently developed. So in terms of an overview for my portion of the talk here, um, we'll briefly give a, an overview of the company structure, how we manufacture the cells, and then our product portfolio then uh, morph into the, an overview of the isol cardiomyocytes and ways that they can be used uh, in toxicity testing. Then, as mentioned, I'll go into a couple of recent advancements. And then I'll turn it over to Dr. Matthew Brock, who will talk about how um, Genentech is actually using these cells and, and their broader view on testing in vitro toxicity. All right, so cellular dynamics. <clears throat> We're the world's largest producer of human iPS cells and the uh, tissue cells derived from those cells. Um, as you can see on the slide here, I've split this out into two different areas, our infrastructure and our competencies. And so the left-hand side, the infrastructure, is meant to, 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 to show you that we are well enabled to do what we do. And the competencies are thus are meant to show you that we can do what I'm telling you we can do. So from an infrastructure side, we're about 160 people, um, and we've got really distinct R&D, process science, and manufacturing teams. So R&D develops protocols, process science scales them up, and manufacturer um, just turns the crank and, and turns out that product. Um, we've got an extensive amount of, of experience in stem cell biology. Um, we're headquartered in Madison, Wisconsin, but we serve and support the global market. And as you can see, we've got um, a good handle on an incredibly complex um, IP landscape. So we're able to do what we do and customers are able to do um, to use the cells. Right, our competency is really fourfold here. It's the creation and culture of stem cells. So that would be reprogramming and then just basically cell culture husbandry. We can also uh, genetically engineer these lines or these cells to help in the differentiation. So put in selection engineering or also put in various pathway or, or marker specific um, markers. Um, we continually are developing new stem cell cell types. Um, we can do that across all three germ layers. And last but not least is then translating that, that uh, research into large scale production so we can get them out into the customer base for use. Right, at a real high level, um, we really got to take advantage or meet several uh, requirements to take advantage of the uh, uh, stem cell technology. 
And, and those requirements for, for really a scale up are gonna be a very tight differentiation in manufacturing specifications. We, we, we've moved this from a science fair experiment into an industrialized manufacturing uh, system. And this really relies on a strong quality management system. Um, as mentioned before, um, we have the ability to uh, for genome modification. And again, this is really essential to take full advantage of the IPSC technology. Then also we have to be able to scale up this process. And we've really been able to do that. Um, we see on the right hand side there a little window of our scale up manufacturing benchmarks where we can really manufacture any of our cell types in, in billions of cells which is uh, are meant to fully enable any type of screening project. The um, gross arrow uh, diagram there that, that's in the center of the screen really outlines how we do the manufacturing. And that is we create a bank, a specific bank of stem cells each time we go to manufacture a new batch of terminal cells, such as cardiomyocytes, we would then um, expand and aliquot from that working bank, differentiate the cells, purify, QC them, and then store them so they're ready to ship. So again, this is not made to order. This is you order and we ship right away. When we need to make additional batches of cells, we go back to that same starting material. So there is no, um, um, variability there based on donors, no unwanted variability. All right, the next part of, of taking advantage of the IPSC technology is to be able to scale out. So we have to scale up, make a lot of the cells from an individual donor, but we have to be able to make cells from multiple donors, hundreds if not thousands of donors. And we've also um, really cracked the nut on that. So we can do parallel derivation and differentiation from multiple donors. Right? And the bubble on the right hand side now is just two examples of the scale out capabilities. We are finishing up a grant now where we are supplying approximately 250 um, uh, batches of cardiomyocytes that have been reprogrammed from 250 different donors that have varying levels of left ventricular hypertrophy. This is part of an NHLBI study that will really further the GWAS correlation between genome-wide sequence variations and functional outcomes. We're also involved um, in a California Institute for Regenerative Medicine grant where we are generating uh, 9,000 clones across 3,000 individuals. These individuals will be from uh, 11 different disease types as well as a variety of control populations. So we're well versed um, in generating a lot of cells from a lot of donors. Um, we really applied this technology then to our product portfolio as shown here on this slide. Uh, the products, the iCell products are listed on the left hand side and these are simple off the shelf um, standard in vitro stem cell models. So whether it's cardiomyocytes, neuronal lineages, blood lineages, skeletal myoblasts. These are what I guess we could call our vanilla IPSC derived tissue cells. The middle um, column here um, exemplifies and provides some examples from our diversity and disease portfolio. So here we were taking samples and making cells from uh, donors that incorporate disease and diversity. So the first part of diversity is to get a variety of both male and female donors into, into our uh, um, production scheme. Um, we've also then are branching out further into various diseases um, in cardiomyocytes, neurons, and hepatocytes. We've got a little bit of a, a coming soon blurb there on the bottom, and that's simply to exemplify that this is continually expanding, and so contact your rep, contact CDI for an updated list on, on this ex product line expansion. The far right hand side then lists our MyCell products. This is our custom reprogramming. This is highly, highly customizable. We can do uh, IPSC reprogramming from a donor of choice, customer choice. We can go ahead and genetically engineer that line. Uh, we can differentiate that line or any of, any, uh, of those three uh, subdivisions. So it's really customizable. Um, this is a custom order. So it's where you contact our team. We then um, go down the road of making those cells for you. But to keep it straight, 
what we end up doing here is that I sell models are representative models off the shelf. The DDP, so the diversity and disease portfolio, those can be a mixture of off the shelf or differentiated to order. And then the MyCell is really population specific models which are custom manufacturing. All right. We're gonna um, really, really made a strong and continual effort to partner with a variety of platform providers, CROs, reagent providers, because the cells are just one part of the equation. You really have to have the material to um, use and interrogate the cells for them to really be of any use for you. So again, um, we've made a lot of effort um, through our application group to develop protocols and applications for use of these cells. So. Chances are, if you want to use them in an assay, we've already done it, or can direct you to somebody who has done it. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. Right? And those efforts are really headed up by our application development team. This is a team of nine, I think actually now 11 scientists. We've got a broad set of experience from academia to drug development to CROs. And a number of, of really wins um, in their applications, whether it's miniaturizing the 1536 well assays, developing new assays, uh, functional assays based on, say, cardiac hypertrophy or APOE release for Alzheimer's, or various um, functional toxicity outputs, such as uh, neurite growth or cellular electrophysiology. Again, it's a, it's a, it's a team that's at the disposal of our customers. All right. Um, they're well versed in our product line. <clears throat> However, we're going to focus today on the ISOL cardiomyocytes. So again, these are human cardiomyocytes, highly pure, and they come in unit sizes that will plate um, at minimum a 96, 384, or 1536 well plate. So you're able to plan your experiments based on the units of cells uh, that you order. Um, we've got a broad customer publication base with greater than 40 publications. And we're really utilized by over 90% of the top pharmaceutical companies. Really the value of these cells is then shown in this next slide, slide 10. So if we could pop out here for a second to a video um, that will show the, uh, the spontaneously beating cardiomyocytes. All right, thank you, Rachel. Um, so that, 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 that image there really sums up the um, value of the cardiomyocytes. That beating exemplifies that they've got the, the, the relevant biology, and they've got the native processes that will then enable downstream use. All right. Um, all right, so this is one um, characterization slide that we have for the cardiomyocytes just to really kind of set the stage. Um, if we look on the upper left-hand graph, um, this just exemplifies uh, a whole genome expression profile. And it's meant to show the, the blue and the red lines overlap. These look at the transcription profile at 30 days uh, post-differentiation versus another 90 days in culture. So the fact that those lines overlap uh, indicates that we've got very stable expression profile over 90 days. Um, they trend, those two lines trend very well with the dotted line which is expression profile from adult tissue. So we've got stable expression values, or stable expression, as well as relevant cardiac expression. So they're making what they should make. Uh, the protein expression image in the right-hand side, again, shows the high purity of cells, as well as the sarcomeric organization of the, of the uh, um, uh, proteins within the cells. Upper right-hand side shows a, a graph from Seahorse Bioscience, showing that the mitochondria are active. So a basic component of, of um, cardiac uh, physiology is active mitochondria, and they are active in these cells. Lower right-hand side is just a schematic to illustrate that the biochemical processes are in place. And the uh, lower middle graph shows that we've got the appropriate EC, or excitation contraction coupling. So electrical events at the membrane are transferred through calcium transients into contraction. So it really has a full suite of uh, um, functionality for testing. All right, um, you can take my word for it or you can go to our publication uh, database. So we've got well over 40 publications um, that go, that span the, the gap from basic characterization 
to a variety way of ways of toxicity testing, as well as disease modeling and phenotypic screening. So I strongly encourage you to, to visit that um, if you have um, additional questions about items that we're not covering in today's uh, talk. Okay, I'm pressing next and we're coming up a little slow here. There you go. All right, so to so, so jump down into, into the toxicity testing to really set the stage here, I wanted to go over a little type of, a little bit of the terminology. So first, on target toxic, sorry, on target toxicity. Here the molecule hits the target, but has unintended adverse events. So for example, potassium channel antagonists were developed early on to be antiarrhythmic. Well, it turns out they're actually proarrhythmic. This comes because we didn't have a good understanding of the biology at the time of their development. Another example would be uh, kinase inhibitors that are used to disrupt targeted pathways in cancer cells, but those same pathways are present in cardiac cells. Thus, we've got an overlapping biology, unintended toxicity there. Right, Off-target toxicity is where the molecule hits something completely different than it was intended to hit. So examples would be um, targeting H1 receptors they end up blocking herb channels and, and, and can be proarrhythmic. Um, secondly, a more recent example would be where activated T cells that targeted cancer cells actually cross-reacted with uh, the cardiac titan protein and caused deaths in the uh, clinical trials. So the off-target toxicity or on-target toxicity has these adverse events. And the bottom line for this is that in order to accurately predict this toxicity, you've got to have a prep that covers all of the relevant uh, biology and functionality. And that's where the isol cardiomyocytes come in. The two main classes of, of toxicity that one uh, will be able to test here would be um, functional toxicity, where I at least define that as an acute effect on the electrical or the mechanical function. So that can be um, electrical events at the membrane, the calcium signaling, or that mechanical event of contractility. Structural events are really uh, where the primary effect is on a general cellular process that may ultimately lead to a functional consequence. And again, to, um, to cover both of these toxicities, you've got to have that relevant cell system. The nine cell cardiomyocytes can provide that system um, in a variety of ways. From a, a, a structural toxicity standpoint, you've got a, a variety of endpoints and then a variety of platforms which, with which you can test for structural toxicity. The functional toxicity, again, where you're testing um, that EC coupling, those, those again can be broken down into discrete events that can be tested through a multitude of platforms. And because you've got the full functionality in a single package, you can now test how, how surrogate structural markers and, and the various functional markers can really be surrogate markers for each other. So you can address through phenotypic screening all of these endpoints in similar and in, in, in single or relatively few number of assays. And I think that Matt will really go into ways that um, they're looking at this and Genentech is looking at this, taking advantage of the co evolution of the cells as well as the multiplex platforms. All right, so that's, that's really an overview of the I-cell cardiomyocytes. I've got a couple of minutes here um, that I'd like to finish up with uh, uh, using our new product, I-cell cardiomyocytes squared, as well as some data on serum-free recording conditions. So the first thing to talk about with when we come out with a new product is why. Why do we do that? Well, it's really a response to customer requests um, or needs. Um, I think that's a polite way of saying demands. Um, and these really come down to they want less handling and shorter culture times. And the reasons for those uh, are fairly obvious. So our answer to that was the isol cardiomyocytes squared. It's the same starting material as isol cardiomyocytes, so it's the same cell, excuse me, same cell type. Um, it comes in the same format, so it's cryopreserved. Unit size is a single plate. The advantage here is that it's ready to use within four days. And that's really uh, uh, hit home on this slide, where we see the original version, isol cardiomyocytes. We have really a 14-day incubation time um, with media changes every other day. 
At day 14, you're guaranteed that you're going to have stable electrophysiological um, um, functionality. The isocardiomyocyte squared shortens that to a four-day pro uh, protocol, right? And you've only got media changes every day. So it's, it's a minute, or absolutely not every day, it's, it's still every other day, so it's really one to two media changes. So what you see here then is really a drastic reduction in A, the turnaround time, and B, the amount of handling that one has uh, with these cells. And we've developed another protocol with these cells. Um, the four-day protocol is shown in the upper uh, um, subway diagram here, where it's a Monday to Friday protocol. So you need to answer quickly. You can do that Monday to Friday. You don't have any weekend work. However, the beauty of these cells is that they're stable in culture, and so you can extend that assay window over for several days if you have multiple experiments to do. Um, to avoid weekend work, then we developed a Wednesday to Wednesday protocol. And that's shown down on the lower, um, uh, lower diagram, where again, you can thaw the cells on a Wednesday, change the media on Friday, there's no weekend work, change the media again the next day or at the end of the weekend, so Monday, um, and then again change on Tuesday, and then on day seven, which would be Wednesday, you're ready to go, and you can very easily have three days of recording, again, without any weekend work. So the main thrust of these new protocols is to shorten the amount of time, decrease the amount of handling, um, and get rid of any type of weekend work. I think we're pretty successful at that. All right, we've got just a little bit of data here, um, and I urge you to contact application support or technical support for, for more uh, data on this, but we've got protocols for um, using them in impedance recordings. As we can see here, brief uh, screenshots, uh, that we get the expected responses across a variety of chemical classes. Um, there's a great demand for MEA recordings, and so we also have an off-the-shelf um, MEA recording protocol. And again, we've got the expected responses uh, in chemical space. All right, another customer demand um, request has been to develop serum-free recording conditions, and we've successfully done that as well. So here, again, I can see the standard subway diagram. So the workflows, either four-day or seven-day, are very similar. Um, the, the, the obvious change here is that you need to do a, a media change before you start to culture the cells to put them into that serum-free media. And right, again, um, very limited amount of data here, but um, that we're showing, we have more uh, at, at the home office here. But again, you see standard um, physiological waveforms in standard media versus serum-free media, and you've got very even beating rates. Um, very consistent beat rate and a very low um, uh, coefficient of variability. So it's even beat rate, very reproducible. Again, we've got uh, robust responses um, for either workflow across chemical space. Here we're looking at herd channel block on the left in, in normal media versus serum free media, as well as uh, receptor activation on the right, again, in serum containing or serum free media. So we really developed a faster workflow, as well as a workflow that's conducive to um, um, doing your experiments um, without the specter of, of protein binding. All right, to summarize, I simply refer back to the uh, overview slide. So from a CDI perspective, uh, we've established ourselves as the leading provider of iPSC-derived cell types. Um, I think we have a first-class product first-class support, and together that really enables success for the customers. The cardiomyocytes, um, for those of you that know me, you've been hearing me um, kind of yap about this for years, but they really do recapitulate the human biology. Um, they're easy to use, and the most important thing is that they're field validated. So we have a strong customer database that one can refer to for validation and um, qualification of the various endpoints and uses. Um, we've got the new products, um, isolate cardiomyocyte squared, as well as serum-free recording conditions. So I've gone a bit over my time. I, I apologize to Matt, um, but I'd like to turn it over to Matt now, where he can uh, um, really go into the, the practical use and, and how their company um, conducts their in vitro toxicology testing. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions at the end of the uh, seminar.
Uh, thanks for the invitation, Dr. Anson. Um, the, uh, let me pull up my slides here. Yeah, I have to say that uh, the, uh, I'm not drawing from a deep well of experience uh, here at Genentech yet. I've been here for uh, about six months uh, and I uh, was kind of brought on board specifically to uh, work with these cells and the uh, technologies that uh, enable us to record from them. Uh, but my, the well is a bit deeper for uh, the cells themselves, which I've been working with for uh, the better part of five years. Uh, and so I have watched the uh, technology platforms grow around the cells. Um, so the, the outline of the, the talk is here. Uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about uh, our group at Genentech uh, and then how the iCell cardiomyocytes fit into our work here. Uh, and then uh, really the emphasis will, will be on the uh, methods we use to record from the cells. Uh, I'll talk about a couple use cases uh, for different projects here at Genentech, but again, these are just a, more of a context uh, to show how we work with these cells uh, than a, um, an explanation of the projects uh, themselves. So, uh, and then this will be a good uh, transition into uh, a couple different topics. The first is uh, an emphasis on uh, how we're trying to multiplex more information from single assay plates. Uh, and and this will also form the background for uh, an initial evaluation of the, uh, the new product that Dr. Anson described, which is the iCell cardiomyocyte squared. So the investigative toxicology group that I work in at Genentech is really the, the research arm of the safety assessment department. Um, we, we focus on in vitro cell-based assays, hopefully plate-based assays, um, but we, we work with project teams in all stages of development from early research to, uh, to early clinical. We are uh, by no means the filter through which all compounds at Genentech uh, must pass through. Uh, we're really uh, <clears throat> we're really called in for cause, usually to try to uh, figure out a mechanism of toxicity. Um, so we, uh, and it's also important to point out that uh, we outsource a lot of routine screening, uh, such as uh, HERD binding, NAV, CAV binding. Uh, to CROs. Our emphasis is on really developing new assays to elucidate mechanisms of toxicity. Um, and, and as such, we, we really have a mandate to uh, evaluate new technology, improve upon it, uh, incorporate new cell-based products um, uh, into our workflow, and, and hopefully this allows us to, uh, to increase the amount of data we can get out of cells or particular platforms and, and also increase the, the turnaround for our project teams. Uh, the cardiovascular side of uh, investigative toxicology is, is smaller. Uh, of course, uh, the real stars of the show here are the cells. And indeed, the iCell cardiomyocytes are, are really the cell that we, uh, that we use the most. We have uh, a lot of momentum with these cells, but they are uh, remarkably robust in, in most of the assays that we use them for. Uh, and that will be uh, the rest of the talk. I'll show you a lot of that. Um, we do work with some other types of cardiomyocytes uh, from rat and, and mouse. This is usually to address species-specific tox issues. Uh, but the, the human IPSC derived cardiomyocytes are, are really the most adaptable to a variety of assays. Uh, we are well equipped with, uh, with systems that are broadly applicable for uh, different cell types, uh, hepatocytes, uh, immune cells, uh, such as uh, high content imaging. Uh, we, we do some next gen sequencing. Um, we have lots of plate readers. Uh, but the emphasis of our work with the iCell cardiomyocytes has really been on platforms that uh, directly address uh, their functional beating phenotype. And the, the two main ways that we've done that 
uh, are with multi-electrode array and, and more recently with some video analysis of the cardiomyocytes beating. Uh, I, I won't go on here at length because uh, Blake has addressed uh, many of the advantages uh, of these cell types. Uh, they're basically, to us, a, a comprehensive in vitro uh, human cardiac phenotype uh, down to the, the actual functional beating. Um, for us, the, a real advantage of these cells uh, is the low vial to vial and well to well uh, variability that we see in their properties. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, uh, the fact that these are just so robust over time uh, in culture, because uh, while some of our, our work is, is dealing with acute ion channel blockade effects that you can record in, in an hour, uh, a lot of our work really uh, requires that we study these cells in the presence of a compound uh, for one week or two weeks, during which we need the properties of these cells uh, to be stable. Um, there, there are always concerns about new products, uh, you know, some of the arguments levied against uh, human iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes are that they're, they're arguably young um, uh, compared to an adult cardiomyocyte. Uh, the spontaneous beating uh, bothers some people. Uh, it's uh, unlike a, an isolated adult uh, ventricular cardiomyocyte, uh, but again, we, we really love the fact that these beat spontaneously. Um, Really, the, the proof is in the pudding here, which is that um, there are now uh, numerous studies and publications that have shown uh, both for arrhythmia prediction and, and for structural tox, uh, the predictivity uh, of these cells is remarkably good. Uh, the spontaneous uh, beating is, is really helpful for, for non-invasive assays. Uh, again, that, that'll be the emphasis of my talk. Um, and I, uh, just to address the, the stability uh, of these cells in culture and, and the stability of the beating uh, properties, uh, I'd like to submit a kind of half-baked uh, plate that we've uh, dubbed Stumpy uh, in the lab, which uh, is just a, a 96, standard 96 well uh, plate uh, that is full of some leftover cardiomyocytes. Uh, we, we plated some other plates uh, that we had a, a purpose for, and then we had some leftover ones. These were plated, uh, it's called Stumpy because we only uh, made it halfway through the plate um, before we ran out of cells. And, and the cells were actually plated a little bit thinly. Uh, but uh, I've, I've had ideas over the past uh, 70 days about what I was gonna do with this plate, uh, had some fancy pharmacology I wanted to throw at it. Uh, but I really never got around to it. But what we have been doing with this plate is, is recording its uh, beat properties uh, in all of the wells that are full of cells um, periodically and feeding it every two or three days. Uh, it's, it's been neglected experimentally, but it's really served as a test of, of how robust and, uh, uh, and, and the, the longevity of these cells in culture. And you can see it at lower left, the uh, the beats per minute uh, between uh, when we first started recording at about uh, 11 days, and now, which is about 70 days uh, post-plating, has, has hovered around uh, 35 beats per minute. Uh, these things are still going strong. Uh, the contraction duration, which is at uh, lower right, uh, has been around 350 milliseconds. I'll get into how we've recorded these, but the, the emphasis here is that these are uh, remarkably stable in their phenotype. And this is really important uh, for our work because we, we have been asked to do 30-day studies with these cells. Um, I'll get into some basic uh, protocols uh, that really apply to most of the, the assays that we use. Um, so I don't have to go into these for, for each of the, uh, the platforms. Uh, these cells uh, are thawed and plated directly into the, the multi-well assay plates, uh, usually at around 40 to 50,000 cells per well. Uh, the standard eye cells require a, a couple weeks of recovery, uh, and, uh, which allows them to form a syncytium and stabilize their beat properties. Uh, that two weeks is, is usually fine for us. Um, they're maintained and, and recorded in medium with serum, although as, uh, as Blake said, 
Uh, for shorter experiments, you can you can do without the serum. We just uh, don't do that for uh, for experiments that uh, where we're monitoring the cells for a week or two, uh, because the serum seems to be important for long-term stability of feeding. Um, we feed these cells every two or three days uh, and uh, refresh the, the compound as well if we're post-dose. And uh, we generally refresh the medium the day before, uh, before an experiment because we want to give the cells a little time to settle down before we start uh, recording them. Um, all of the experiments I'll show uh, are done at 37 degrees uh, and at 5% uh, CO2. Uh, either because the instrument is, is in an incubator or we're bringing the 5% CO2 to the incubator or to the instrument. Um, I don't need to go into the rest of that. Uh, so really our wheelhouse uh, for, for functional studies has been uh, multi-electrode array recordings. Um, so as, as Blake said, you, you see these cells into uh, a petri dish and uh, given enough time they form a spontaneously beating syncytium. Uh, there's no reason you can't have some field potential electrodes uh, embedded in the cell culture substrate. Um, and uh, these are generally coplanar with a cell culture uh, surface. They're non-invasive. Uh, and uh, you can see uh, in the middle there uh, a micrograph of a monolayer of cells growing on uh, a multi-electrode array. Uh, in a petri dish, essentially. Uh, and these electrodes thus serve as a, an in vitro uh, ECG. Uh, so during the spontaneous beating, uh, you get many of the same waveform features as you would see in an ECG, uh, including a QRS uh, depolarization spike, a repolarization bump, or a T wave, uh, and the, uh, the Duration uh, or the interval in between those two features uh, is a surrogate of the QT interval, or we'll call it field potential duration uh, to be safe here. And of course, you can get a beat period uh, by looking at the uh, time in between the depolarization spikes, and you can get a spike amplitude, which generally reflects the amount of current that you see during a depolarization. That would be through sodium channel. Uh, there are some advantages of having uh, a grid of electrodes um, in a given well or dish. Uh, one is that uh, the redundancy uh, gives you a better chance of finding a T wave that the software can read. Um, the other uh, is that the depolarization uh, spike will reach the electrodes at different times, which allows you to actually track the propagation uh, of the electrical excitation across the grid, and this allows you to uh, extract uh, a conduction velocity uh, from the different electrodes. So the, the system uh, that we use the most here in-house uh, is the Axion uh, multi-well MEA system. Uh, MEA systems have, have been around in some form of an, uh, or another for uh, roughly four decades, um, but what Axion has done is, is turn this into a legitimate uh, multi-well platform. Uh, so the system itself is shown at upper left. Uh, it's uh, small for a plate reader. Uh, it's environmentally and temperature controlled. Uh, the plate that we use most often is a 48 well plate uh, in which each well has 16 non-invasive field potential electrodes in a four by four grid. Um, again, a, a strong advantage uh, of the multi-electrode array approach is that because these electrodes are non-invasive, you get serial recordings from the same plate. So we can pop this, this plate into the uh, recorder uh, every day for a month uh, if you want to. Um, typically, we'll, we'll do uh, closely spaced recordings, uh, you know, for the first few hours and then maybe monitor the plate uh, once a day for, for longer term recordings. Um, the, there's high spatial and, and time resolution, uh, so we're sampling at 20 kilohertz, uh, which gives you really uh, fine, uh, fine resolution of the depolarization features. Um, Again, the multiple electrodes give you information about the propagation uh, of excitation across the grid uh, and the monolayer of cells. 
uh, makes it easy to find a good T wave uh, for compounds that actually uh, move the field potential duration in one direction or another. Uh, another strong advantage of, uh, of this system is that uh, all of the wells are read in parallel in contrast to objective-based methods of, of looking at cardiomyocytes. So essentially we're done with uh, a plate read after two uh, to five minutes. Um, and this means that uh, post-dose uh, our compound exposure uh, times are identical for all of the different wells. Uh, some limitations which are re really being addressed actively uh, by the, the manufacturer that the, the, and I'll talk about some of these later, um, are that uh, the 48 well plate is, is opaque, so you're kind of flying blind um, in terms of whether your cells are there. You can see it functionally, of course. Um, in terms of being able to paste the cells, uh, MEA electrodes are, are a little inefficient because of their size. Again, this is something that the, uh, will be addressed in future iterations of plates. Um, and uh, for us, the, uh, the field potential that we're measuring is uh, in concept upstream of some of the targets uh, that we'd like to screen. Although uh, I'll explain that uh, essentially almost everything feeds back on field potential. Um, the system has seen great use recently uh, in, uh, as predictive of uh, clinical arrhythmia. Um, you can do a, a Google search for uh, the HESI SIPA initiative. Um, essentially, uh, if you look at bottom left, you're looking at uh, the raw field potential signal from one electrode in one well, and you can see the spontaneous uh, depolarizations. Uh, the repolarization bumps are kind of lost in the uh, total scale here. Uh, but at left is pre-dose. Uh, in, in the center, you see the signal in uh, the presence of uh, a HERG blocker, cisapride. You can see the uh, beat period is extended. And there are some little aberrant depolarizations. Uh, you might call them ectopic beats or after depolarizations um, that arise in the presence of cisapride. And you can make dose response curves for HERG blockers uh, or, or calcium blockers, sodium channel blockers. The system has seen great use uh, for this purpose. Uh, and, and indeed, we, we do use it for this purpose at Genentech. Some of our compounds show obvious uh, ion channel uh, blockade. Often we know this because we've screened them for HERG uh, or NAV or CAV uh, binding. Uh, this is a, a project at Genentech where, where we do see those effects. Uh, raw data traces are shown at top. Uh, at, at the left, you see a, um, a raw field potential signal uh, pre-dose, and then at right, post-dose uh, with a, a first-generation compound from this project. Uh, and you can see in the presence of the compound, uh, there are uh, ectopic beats that arise. The, uh, beat period is extended. Uh, you see notched T waves or after depolarizations. At bottom left, you see a, uh, an overlay of the pre and post dose uh, waveform, and you can see in red that the, uh, the waveform in the presence of drug uh, shows a, a delayed uh, repolarization feature. And you can plot this uh, at bottom right. Uh, as a, a dose response curve for, uh, for the QT interval or field potential duration. You can see that the generation one compound does have some issues at uh, 10 micromolar. We're really at 200% uh, of the baseline QT value, but subsequent uh, iterations from, uh, from chemistry uh, at new compounds for this particular target uh, have reduced the, uh, the ion channel blockade and, and thus the uh, prolongation of the uh, field potential duration. Uh, more often than not, however, we're, we're not dealing with compounds that have obvious ion channel blockade problems, uh, perhaps because these are, are de-risked earlier on through uh, outsourced uh, ion channel binding uh, assays. Uh, so this is a, a particular project that I'll, I'll really spend most of the rest of the talk talking about because it it helps me highlight some of the, uh, the assays that we'll use to look at uh, beating of these cardiomyocytes uh, and also ways that we've multiplexed uh, information that we can get from, uh, from a single well and from a single plate. Um, this 
this project uh, came to us from uh, really at the development stage uh, because there, uh, first of all, there are uh, competitor drugs that target uh, the same pathway, not the same target, uh, that lead to uh, cardiac issues, specifically uh, left ventricular ejection fraction uh, issues. Uh, but in-house, in, in preclinical studies, uh, we observed uh, decreased uh, heart-to-brain ratios and some ultra-structural uh, signs of uh, cardiomyocyte atrophy uh, in seven-day rat studies. And so we were, we were handed these compounds to see what the direct effect on, on cardiomyocytes might be and whether these were consistent what, with what we see in uh, in vivo studies. Uh, so this is showing uh, kind of a first pass assay that we use for, uh, for most of the compounds we get, which is just a, a screen for outright cytotoxicity. Uh, this is a chemiluminescent assay for ATP content that we typically run after three or seven day exposures to compounds. Uh, specifically, this is a cell titer glow assay. Um, and uh, these compounds, which I'm calling GX, uh, and we're talking about GX1 and GX2 here, um, are not cytotoxic uh, by this measure uh, after three or seven day exposures. Uh, these are, are dose response curves uh, for ATP content. Uh, the positive controls are storosphorine, and you can see that this causes significant loss of ATP uh, at either uh, seven days or three days. Uh, GX1 in orange uh, and GX2 uh, in green uh, are, are healthy all the way out to 50 micromolar. So we don't really see any signs of uh, direct cytotoxicity. Um, however, if we, if we look at the functional properties, we see some uh, marked uh, problems. Uh, again, uh, the MEA system is really our first pass for, for functional studies. Uh, I'm sh showing raw traces at top uh, for, for one electrode uh, in one well pre and post dose with 30 micromolar GX1. And you can see uh, uh, very regular beating pre dose. Uh, one day post dose, uh, you start to see uh, both an increase in, uh, in beat rate, but the more profound effect that, that really manifests over the course of the week uh, is a decrease in spike amplitude uh, to the point where after six days, uh, we're just down to little blips on the radar. Um, if you overlay the traces pre and post dose, uh, as you see it right, there, there is a, a decrease in the QT interval, uh, but clearly that is not the largest effect uh, that we would be concerned about. Uh, these cells just are kind of going off radar in terms of spike amplitude. Uh, dose response curves and, and time courses are shown at the bottom. Uh, spike amplitude uh, is uh, in the middle. Uh, beats per minute is at the bottom for for three different compounds uh, from this series. Um, and uh, they're color-coded for dose. Uh, 30 micromolar is in uh, orange and uh, one micromolar is in blue. You can see there's a clear uh, dose dependence and time dependence to this effect where uh, for GX1, for example, after uh, seven days in culture, we're really down to about 30% uh, of the spike amplitude on average. Uh, and the compounds differ in the magnitude of effect, but uh, qualitatively they all act in really the same way. Uh, so this is an effect that generally uh, you might say is consistent with, uh, with the in vivo atrophy that we see. Uh, it is, however, a little hand wavy to, uh, to be talking about uh, the field potential effects. Um, uh, when you're when you're thinking about atrophy, which uh, you would really think is is something downstream of that, um, so we are interested in in screening for uh, for uh, the contraction itself. Again, the you know the excitation uh, is due to uh, you know, ion channels that are present in the cell uh, cell membrane, uh, and these uh, the electrical cycle is really thought to. Uh, to drive the calcium release and then, of course, the contraction. Uh, so, uh, so it's comforting to be able to directly uh, observe contraction and, and we have a way of doing that. Uh, I should say that um, uh, having screened uh, a lot of possible ion handling targets uh, upstream of the, uh, 
the sarcomere itself, virtually everything feeds back on the, uh, the, the field potential. So uh, I would I'd say that somewhere around 95% of uh, possible targets in a cardiomyocyte can be detected by MEA, but there's something very comfortable about directly observing uh, the contraction. And there are some examples of compounds that, that really kind of decouple the contraction uh, from the excitation. Uh, levostatin is, uh, is really the poster child for this, which is something that uh, kills contraction but uh, leaves the um, electrical beat cycle relatively intact. Uh, the system that we've uh, had the most experience with thus far uh, for looking directly at contraction is the uh, Celagy Pulse instrument. This is uh, an instrument that just uh, automated in an automated fashion takes a multi-well plate and goes from well to well, records video, and uh, using pixel tracking um, derives a, a contraction signal. Um, it's, uh, it's directly looking at at the contraction, which is something that we like. Um, it's automated in a nice way, uh, environmentally controlled. Uh, and, and a really nice thing about this is that it uses standard multi-well plates, uh, which we can then pass off uh, uh, to multiplex with uh, high content imaging. Um, and, and I'll talk uh, a little bit about how this can be uh, used also with MEA. Uh, a minor limitation here is that it, it reads one well at a time. So the total read times for the plate uh, can be quite long. Um, uh, so you do end up with uh, non-identical compound exposure times. Um, the, uh, the readouts here are, uh, are contraction amplitude, the, the duration of contraction. I'm showing a raw trace at lower right. Uh, you get beat rate out of these. Uh, you can look at arrhythmia, of course, and, and of course, you, uh, and you can derive a, a percentage of the cells in the visual field that are actually moving. Uh, so we've We've run these GX compounds uh, on the pulse and, and we see uh, effects that really mirror those uh, that we've observed with the MEA system. Uh, these are raw data signals at, at the top pre-dose, at the top left, and then um, at different times post-dose uh, going to the right. Uh, and by one day post-dose, we've, we've really gone down to roughly 20% uh, of the, uh, the pre-dose contraction amplitude. And the dose response curves that we get from these uh, look remarkably similar to what we get with MEA. And you see those at the bottom. Uh, we've looked a little bit at, uh, at recovery from the compounds, uh, although we need to look at this at, at slightly better time resolution. But uh, if you wash these cell, uh, the compounds out after uh, a week of exposure, uh, they do recover slowly. Um, we're looking here at GX1 at the top and GX2 uh, at the bottom, uh, pre-dose and then eight days post-dose in the middle, uh, and then four days post-washout. Some of the amplitude is recovered, but not all of it is recovered. So uh, this is not an instantaneous recovery like you would see with some sort of uh, acute ion channel antagonism. Uh, and this is just further evidence that we've done something uh, substantial to these cells structurally. Um, you might think that if, if this is consistent with atrophy, perhaps we would uh, observe some uh, effects on, on the integrity of the, the monolayer. We can, we can address this by using the, uh, the array of electrodes, as I described before, um, and, and look at the propagation of these spontaneous beats across, uh, across the grid of electrodes. Um, you're looking at uh, propagation maps at the top here. Uh, at uh, 72 hours post-dose uh, with vehicle at upper left and then in, in the presence of GX1 or GX2, uh, middle and right respectively. And uh, the range of colors that you see here is really representative of the speed and they're similar uh, for all of these. Uh, so the, the rate of propagation is really not affected by these compounds. If you look at bottom right, uh, this is conduction velocity, uh, pre-dose uh, in the empty bars and the filled bars are post-dose and really there's no, there's no change. Um, the bo at bottom left, this is to emphasize that these recordings are, are done at a time when uh, we've reduced the contraction amplitude down to uh, between 20 and 40%. So while we're affecting these cells functionally, 
uh, we're not really disrupting the monolayer in any substantial way. And this is also consistent with the idea that uh, we're not really seeing cell death. Uh, so uh, as I said at the beginning of the talk, uh, a real emphasis of ours has been on uh, multiplexing different endpoints. Um, we were comfortable running these experiments in parallel, but a dream of mine is to be able to use a single plate to get all of these endpoints. And in fact, a, a recent development uh, at Axion has, has made some of this possible, uh, which is the development of uh, a transparent MEA uh, in a 48-well uh, uh, format. And that's shown at upper left. Uh, we've had the, the good fortune uh, to, to work with some of the prototypes. And the beauty here is that we can get MEA data and also uh, pulse contraction data from the same plate. Um, and the other thing I should say is that uh, the transparent plate allows us to send this off to high content imaging uh, when we're done with the other assays. And so I'll, uh, I'll let lab roots uh, take you to a video of these cells contracting uh, in real time uh, on a, a transparent MEA plate. And so we don't do these recordings um, uh, simultaneously. We do have to cycle between the two instruments, but we can get uh, both data uh, types from the same plate. Um, and this also serves as, as the starting point for, for our evaluation of the high cell squared product. Um, and this is uh, looking at the pulse properties of, of this TMEA, uh, again, contraction by uh, pixel analysis. Uh, I'm showing raw data traces for each of the 48 wells laid out at, uh, as the geometry of the wells would be in the plate. Uh, and you can see that the, the timing of the beating is, is remarkably consistent across all of the wells. Uh, I've analyzed the, uh, the averages for beat periods, uh, uh, the beat duration, uh, peak amplitude at the bottom, these are in histogram form with all of the averages for the 48 wells. And you can see that the distribution here is really remarkably tight, particularly for beat rate and beat duration. And, and we, uh, I'm comfortable with the, the distribution for peak amplitude too. Um, and, uh, but generally this is a, a property that's a little more variable, both uh, for, uh, for video recordings and MEA, I should say. Uh, we've done some, some initial tests to, uh, to see whether these signals co-vary when we apply some usual ion channel blocker suspects. Uh, we're looking at a, the Herd blocker uh, at top E4031, and, and at the bottom is a calcium channel blocker and a thetapine. Uh, and these are uh, field potential recordings and contraction recordings from the same plate. So pre-dose baseline in each case is shown at left, and then post-dose is uh, at right. Uh, and you can see that in for both of these compounds, uh, the, the effects are remarkably similar. Uh, so we're pretty excited that we can get these, uh, these two types of data in parallel from the same plate. And then there's, of course, a lot of excitement that we can then pass these plates off uh, to a high content imager to look at, uh, to look at things like sarcomere structure. Uh, this is just a, a first pass attempt using a, a TMEA uh, with a, a couple really common labels. Uh, the first is DAPI, which is a, a nuclear stain uh, in blue, and then alpha actinin, uh, which stains, uh, stains the sarcomere uh, in green. And you can see a nice striated uh, sarcomere structure at right. Uh, we're still working out. So, uh, it, it's a little hard to see the uh, definition of a given cell. These cells are, are really packed into this particular plate. So we can probably plate them a little more thinly or use something that would uh, outline the cells in a way that would uh, uh, let us define them a little bit better. Uh, but this is really uh, in progress and will, uh, will certainly uh, be optimized over time. Um, another way of multiplexing uh, that we've explored uh, recently is purely electrical multiplexing. We've, uh, we've had the good fortune uh, 
lately to uh, to demo uh, a new impedance-based system uh, from ACIA. Uh, this is the Excelligence RTCA Cardio ECR um, instrument. Uh, ACIA has been in, in the impedance business for a long time, uh, uh, I think predating the, uh, the advent of stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes, uh, but uh, as they've realized that these systems are, are a way of recording the, the uh, real-time beating of cardiomyocytes, they've just really piled on the, uh, the acronyms to uh, indicate the added functionality. Um, impedance, I should, I should talk a little bit about, uh, but you can, you can probably Google this. There are a lot of webinars about how impedance works to record the real-time beating. Uh, essentially, you're, you're looking at the uh, um, resistance uh, through the, the monolayer uh, of cardiomyocytes. Um, and uh, the cells themselves form a, a basically a, a constant uh, impedance, uh, but the, the movement of the cells during beating causes small fluctuations in this signal. Uh, and you can see this at the, the graph at right that allow you to monitor uh, the contraction in real time. Um, in addition to the effects on, uh, on the beating, uh, you can look at effects on uh, the number of cells that are remaining uh, on the surface because if you have a compound that causes cell death, uh, you really reduce the overall impedance. Uh, and so it's nice to be able to monitor this in parallel. So essentially uh, a system like this gives you the uh, ability to, uh, to monitor uh, both the real-time beating, uh, the integrity of the monolayer, and what they've added to this uh, most recent version is a couple field potential electrodes. Uh, so you're really getting three types of uh, uh, electrical uh, information, uh, or this is, uh, I should say, purely electrical multiplexing with a single plate. Um, again, the, the nice thing here is that the, uh, the contraction signal and, and field potential are recorded simultaneously. Um, you can run this system in an incubator, which is nice. Um, like the MEA system, the wells are read uh, in, par in parallel, so that there are short plate read times. Um, uh, it, it works well for stimulation. Uh, a limitation is, uh, this is a minor one, but it's, uh, you're not looking directly at contraction. This is sort of an uh, electrical derivative of the contraction, unlike the, the video analysis. Uh, there are only two field potential electrodes uh, per well, uh, so versus a, a true uh, grid, of, of electrodes, you have a harder time finding a good T-wave shape, so this would uh, not be our, uh, our first pass for, uh, for QT effects. Uh, and because you only have two electrodes, you don't get a propagation pattern. Um, and the cell, uh, I should say, the plates are opaque, so you can't follow up with a, a high content imaging. Uh, but we were excited to test this system, and it, uh, it seems to fit well with this particular project uh, because of the endpoints that you get. Um, so, uh, and here's some preliminary data with the, uh, the GX1 compound. Uh, I should also emphasize this is using the iCell squared products. Um, the, uh, these signals are recorded in parallel again. In red, we're looking at the, uh, the impedance signal or, or what they call cell index. Uh, and below that is uh, the simultaneously recorded field potential. Um, Pre-dose is on the left, uh, and seven days post-dose with uh, 30 micromolar GX1 is shown at the right. And you can see that both of these signals are, are profoundly reduced uh, over time. The time course and dose dependence uh, for both of these are, are shown uh, at the bottom. So at the bottom left, we're looking at uh, the, the impedance contraction amplitude, and you can see dose response curves and, and time courses that are similar to what we saw before with the pulse. Um, the field potential uh, data is, is a little noisier, but uh, differences are significant and the trends are similar and not shown in, in the center. And again, an, an important piece of the puzzle is at bottom right, which is, is that we can monitor the, the integrity of the monolayer by looking at the total cell, uh, the total impedance uh, across the monolayer. And these compounds don't have much of an effect. Uh, this is important because it, it's in contrast to some other uh, compounds that are known to be cardiotoxic. Uh, we're using doxorubicin here as an example. Um, the, uh, again, post-dose versus pre-dose, we see a profound reduction uh, in the presence of doxorubicin, in this case after two days. 
um, and the uh, time course for the for the reduction in contraction amplitude is shown at bottom left. Um, looks uh, somewhat similar qualitatively to what we see with GX1, uh, but what you see at bottom right is uh, is the overall impedance or overall cell index, uh, which again is a, a measure of uh, the number of uh, remaining cells or the integrity of the monolayer, and. And the time course of this is exactly uh, the same as we see with the contraction amplitude itself, which really tells you that uh, the reduction in amplitude is, uh, of the contraction is just because we have fewer cells contributing to that signal. And this just shows schematically uh, the difference between something like doxorubicin and CX1, which is that for doxorubicin, the, the decrease in contraction amplitude is due to loss of cells, most likely where uh, CX1, we we have an intact monolayer, we just have uh, weaker contractions. Uh, and uh, the last thing I'll show here uh, is, is a ham-fisted attempt to, uh, to address this, uh, the possibility that we're, we're seeing um, atrophy of these cells. Uh, so, so one alternate hypothesis is that uh, we have some sort of reduction in the number of uh, ion channels or perhaps driving force uh, for, for ionic current that is uh, upstream of the effects on contraction. Uh, and perhaps if we can, uh, we can stimulate the cells electrically, we can recover some of that contraction amplitude. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. So uh, we're showing pre-dose baseline the upper left, uh, and then 14 days post-dose uh, with GX1 at the bottom right. You can see the beginning of the bottom right trace spontaneous beating. Uh, this is much weaker than we see uh, two weeks before uh, in the pre-dose condition. And then the red bars are uh, indicating uh, where we've stimulated these cells in an attempt to see if we can get larger contractions. Uh, and you see that we essentially don't. This is shown uh, at bottom right in bar graph form with the pre-dose baseline uh, at left. Uh, contraction amplitude is what we're showing here. And then 14 days later, uh, pre uh, Pre-stimulation amplitude is shown uh, in pink, and then the two red bars are at two different strengths of stimulus. So we can't really recover the, uh, the contraction amplitude. So uh, uh, I can wrap up now. Uh, sorry for going a little bit over. Um, but this, uh, this talk hopefully has highlighted the, uh, the numerous ways we, uh, we can use these cells and how adaptable they are to particular assays. Uh, they really are a rich sort of real-time functional phenotype for, for human cardiomyocytes. Uh, and the, the low well-to-well -well variability and the stability uh, over time has, has really allowed us to, to adapt these cells to, to our purposes here in a number of, of different types of toxicities, um, uh, so including uh, acute ion channel blockade, um, but also, uh, as, as Blake uh, uh, called this uh, structural toxicities that, uh, that take you know, uh, a week or two to manifest. Um, and hopefully I've shown you that uh, an emphasis here uh, is really on multiplexing uh, different functional and structural endpoints from the same plate. And really the, uh, the robustness and longevity of the, uh, the cell product here is what, uh, what allows some of this to happen. And uh, I'm certainly not acting alone here. Um, we've, uh, I have a lot of help in terms of uh, career development and product support. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we're appreciative of all the uh, demo equipment um, that we've gotten to try. Um, and I, uh, I should call particular attention to, to my RA, who's the, the first name here, who's done a lot of the, the fabulous bench work that I've shown. And that's Julia Hyden. Um, and uh, I think with that, we can, we can start taking questions. Excellent presentation, Dr. Brock. Thanks for bringing that information to us. Before I get started with all of your questions, here's a quick reminder about how to reach us today. Questions can be sent via the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll get to as many questions as we can. Our first question is, can you comment on maturation of eye cells compared to native adult cardiac myocytes? This one is for Blake, and then we'll have Matt comment also.
then we'll have Matt comment also. All right, thank you, Judy. Um, yeah, I think Matt touched on this a little bit as, as, as well. Um, you can see from a lot of the images and just the, the morphology of the cells that there's going to be differences in morphology. There's going to be differences in really how the cells line up um, with each other. So, um, you know, versus the um, butt rod shape versus more of a splayed out shape. I think the bottom line is that there's definitely differences between the adult cardiomyocytes and the IPSC cardiomyocytes. Most of that is going to be due to the way that they're cultured. So 2D cultures against a non-yielding plastic substrate. The important thing, though, is to um, know what the boundaries of those limitations are and not to ask too much of the cells. I think that we've been very good in, in, in defining those boundaries and showing that these are an improved um, testing reagent over what's currently out there. So Matt, if, if you'd have anything to counter or add to that, um, please please comment. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think uh, there are a couple ways that I can address that. Um, the first is that uh, the starting point for an adult cardiomyocyte and a stem cell derived cardiomyocyte are, are just radically different. So the uh, stem cell derived cardiomyocytes uh, have advantages in, in terms of, of, uh, of plating. These things basically start in, uh, in suspension, uh, whereas you, an adult cardiomyocyte, you have to uh, sort of pull out of a, an adult organ and uh, study in isolation, which is uh, arguably more disruptive. So uh, it's really hard to know what the, uh, um, what the exact phenotype of an adult cardiomyocyte is um, because of that. Uh, I think another thing is that, uh, that as with many things, the technology uh, will catch up with, with the cells. Uh, I know that people are, are hard at work on, on finding ways to get the cardiomyocytes both to, uh, to line up on something like a, an MEA plate, which would, would give you a, a essentially a, a more adult um, morphology of the cardiomyocyte. And, and there are also uh, attempts, of course, to, to bring these into a, a 3D structure. Um, so uh, I think no one is, uh, no one should be 100% uh, satisfied with, with the product. And as a result, the, the field really moves forward. I think we will see advances uh, in, the, uh, in the platforms and in the uh, types of wells that we record these cells that will will give them a, a more adult morphology and, and, and maybe function. Okay, this question is for Matt. How do you quantify arrhythmic activity in MEA, EAD-like beats, for example? Yeah, it's... Uh, it's an active area of thought um, and uh, and development. Uh, I think it, uh, at MEA manufacturers, uh, it's tricky um, because you are uh, you're looking at high time resolution signals, uh, and uh, it's much easier to uh, kind of train uh, train the software on things that are regular. Uh, the approach in the uh, HESI SIPA initiative, for example, has been to score. Uh, arrhythmias is just kind of plus or minus. Um, it would be nice, however, to uh, to be able to say how many um, EADs you observed. Uh, I think, again, this is, uh, if you can see it with the human eye, you can probably eventually uh, train software uh, to detect these things and quantify them. Uh, presently, uh, because most of our, our projects here are are things like I showed last, which are, are things like uh, easy to quantify in terms of spike amplitude. Um, we haven't really dug into to how to quantify arrhythmias, uh, but I know it's an active area of, uh, of development at the, uh, the platform manufacturers. So that, that's a little hand wavy, but it's, uh, it's not our biggest concern, so it's not really kind of at the top of our to-do list.
Okay, this one's for Matt also. Is the cardiomyocyte assay a better predictor of QT prolongation than a telemetry test? Uh, well, I think the jury is still out. Uh, the, um, I don't, you know, here uh, we are, at Genentech, we are not going to get away uh, from, uh, from things like telemetry tests. Uh, we would hope that, uh, that an in vitro assay, uh, like the MEA system, uh, and the effects uh, on QT in an assay like that uh, would help us guide what compounds made it to uh, telemetry. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not 100%. Uh, I don't think we're going to get away anytime soon uh, from animal studies. We're, we're really just trying to, uh, to kind of pick, pick out bad players uh, a little earlier uh, in an in vitro assay. I don't think one is, uh, one is necessarily uh, more predictive uh, than the other, uh, but, but really the hope uh, in using a human cell type is that we Kind of get around uh, species specific issues um, so uh, uh, I think they both have their uh, their strengths um, and I, I don't think one is really necessarily intended to replace the other uh, we would just hope that we can uh, kind of synthesize the two assays to uh, uh, to come up with a, a more accurate overall picture <laughs> That's all we have time for today. If we did not get to your question, we'll follow up with you via email. I would like to thank our speakers today, Drs. Anson and Brock, as well as our sponsor, Cellular Dynamics International, for making it possible to bring this presentation to you. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through six months from this live presentation. You'll receive an email from us alerting you when it's available on demand and posted on labroots.com. You're welcome to forward that announcement to any colleagues who weren't able to join in today. Thanks for logging on and participating in today's broadcast. See you next time.